So John Burko, formerly Conservative Member of Parliament, is now in the Labour Party. And my next guest, Neil Oliver, formerly of walking around the coast of this great country of ours and a brilliant academic on uh, archaeology and all such matters, is sitting with me next. Like Burko in New Territory, you were in New Territory last night with your first show. Oh my goodness, yes. I, I, I can seldom recall any moments in my life where I was more tense than I was as the clock ticked down to seven o'clock last when I When I first joined this industry in 1976, one of the most experienced presenters, I said, do you still get nervous after all these years? And his name is James, Mon James Montgomery. And he said, the moment you're not nervous when you go into the studio is the day you should stop. Before you come on next, we're going to show Here's a little bit of Neil in action. Oh my. Now, if you're surprised to see me here, you can only imagine how I feel on this side of the camera. This is unexpected, to put it mildly. I think it's unexpected for all of us, but we're living in unexpected times. All manner of things none of us saw coming a year ago have happened, and they keep happening. The previously unthinkable becomes reality every day, and here I am on live television talking about it. How on earth, I ask myself, has this happened? I keep thinking about the scene in the movies where hundreds of soldiers are standing to attention on the parade ground and the regimental sergeant major shouts that he needs a volunteer, anyone willing to take one step forward. And every soldier but one takes two steps back, leaving some poor schmuck out on his own, which is me. I feel like the world has moved beneath my feet, that I stayed put and everything else shifted, so that here I am in this strange place. But I have to say, all things considered, I'm happy to be here because I have things that I want to say and I have questions I want to ask and I want to be able to give a voice to others like me. That's a very, very neat encapsulation of, of, of the philosophy of, of GB News, but, but one step back. A lot of folk are very familiar with you walking the coastline and standing there delivering recorded pieces to camera. How different, deep down, did you find live television from filming with a director and a whole setup? It's it's one hundred percent different. Mm. It's a completely different animal. Uh, what I can compare it to for the last few years, uh, I, I had a, a one man show. You might say I was going around theatres all over Great Britain, talking about a book and a, 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 I suppose a philosophy that I have about the landscape. Uh, and and I'll never I'll never forget the first time I was standing in the wings for my first show in a theatre. I can't remember which theatre, but eight hundred people out there, and I could hear the soft murmur of expectation. <laughs> and I remember looking around at the green exit light over a door and thinking, I could just go home. What could they do? Put me in theatre jail. Sorry, this is all a dreadful mistake. <laughs> but, then, but then I did. I stepped out as you do, and for two hours it was just me. Yeah. And so I, I fell back on that experience last night because I thought, I've done that, and in many ways, it's the same thing, and you yeah. just have to trust that, you know, whatever happens, it's just life. Live yeah. television is just, is just a, is broadcasting what's happening right now. And, and you, you leapt in at the deep end, because, as we've always said about GB News, one of the key things we all want to try and do is not only express our own views on matters, mm. uh, but also we want to put the side of a story that other folk perhaps don't. And you went straight in, deep end, on Head Girls. Well, it might as well, uh, you know, you might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb. I, as soon as I heard talk of GB News, when it was only a rumour, as far as I was concerned, uh, and, that, and it was almost immediately greeted with antipathy and let's kill this, let's scotch this in the egg, uh, my instinct was to run towards that. I thought, oh, that's, that, if that's attracting that kind of attention, that must be the right place to be. You know, if you're attracting flat, you're over the target and all yeah. those adages. And so... Uh, you know, when it comes to, I, I thought, as soon as I get in, I, I'm bombarded all the time by people around me in the community where I live who, who want things aired, they want, they want opinions given and they want questions asked. Uh, and so, you know, when it comes to things like uh, the gender, that whole debate, that everything that's under that umbrella now, people want to air their views. And what's so unnerving at the moment, and for quite a while now, has been this atmosphere in which it's not even appropriate to ask questions. Mm. And that's simply, it, for me, in my heart, I think that cannot prevail. In a free society, you must be allowed freely to ask questions. That, what, what else, how else do we learn? 
you know, how else do we keep... If, if everything always pulls in one direction, then the wagon of, of society will just veer off the road and into the ditch. You need, the, you need to be pulled equally in both directions. Yeah. And briefly, because we're going to chat at greater length about what makes you tick later on, but that's part of the British psyche. It used to be part of what makes us tick. Yes, conversation, yeah. talking, Absolutely. meeting. Yeah. We can't Debating societies at school, getting out there, speaker's corner. Yes, all of that. My wife was, 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 the, was, the, uh, was the captain of a debating team at school and remembers it fondly and she knows that it, it helped make her the person that she is. Well, I look forward to talking to you even more in just a few moments. For now, Neil, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it is exactly one o'clock and GB News is one week old today. I know it's gone quickly, so I thought over the next few months there's a great opportunity for me and you to learn a little bit more about our brilliant lineup. That was the start of it. We'll have more uh, a little bit later on. So uh, stay with me for the rest of the programme. So, as I said, it is now just a little bit after one o'clock, and uh, if you've just switched on, welcome. I'm Alistair Stewart, uh, and I'm here with you until uh, three o'clock. I'll be keeping you company, along with friends like Neil, uh, and some friendly guests as well, like the man who told me, keep your dog off a lead, but train it properly. We have had a great hour, I hope you'd agree, of debate and discussion so far, and there's lots more still to come. School's out a little early for thousands of children as cancelled exams replaced by teacher assessments mean, frankly, well, you know, they might just as well go home. It is the latest knock, however, to our children's education from the pandemic. But is it time that our education system had an MOT top to bottom? I spoke to Robert Halfen, Bob Halfen, a little earlier. He said, no, not an MOT, but a pretty fundamental rethink. And the Prime Minister needs to take a grip. It is the most pressing issue, in his view, as Chair of the Education Select Committee right now. And I agree. In just a moment, you'll be hearing my take on our big story of the day. Also, we'll be getting the word on the street from Kent with our South East reporter, Ellie Costello. And we will be starting our series where we shine a light on good causes across the nation. First up today is the way of the horse, and I promise faithfully I had no say in that. It came from the production team, and I just very happily agreed. It's a very special charity doing some fantastic work in Leicestershire. Now, GB News is all about you, our viewers. Any burning questions, no matter how big or small, we want to hear it. Ask me anything, and I will do my best to answer it. Remember that email address, GBViews? at gbnews.uk and of course you can always make the subject Ask Alastair. Now we have been looking at the state of our education system as our big story this afternoon and asking if it is in need of an MOT. Earlier this month the Education Recovery Commissioner for England, Sir Kevin Collins, resigned in a row over the lack of Covid catch-up funding. Let me just remind you of what the governments across the United Kingdom are pledging and we'll start in England. 1.4 billion pounds over three years. That's in addition to 1.7 billions already announced. In Wales, it's 40 million or 88 pounds per pupil and targeted support there for exam year groups. In Scotland, it's 140 million or 200 pounds per pupil, but there's also 1,400 additional teachers being recruited. In Northern Ireland, 28 million for catch-up support and that works out at 82 pounds per pupil. To me, it is one of the most important things in life, but as the summer break approaches, education seems more bruised and battered than it has ever been. It's not the long-gone brutality of Tom Brown's school days or the dreamy fantasies of goodbye Mr Chips. It's the coronavirus that's disrupted colleges and universities and all schools, and it's exposed sharp differences between the attitudes of some school teachers, the lack of kit in some schools, and the near surplus of it in other schools. It's about what kids are taught and how. The Times Education Forum, a new venture that Rachel Sylvester and colleagues have launched, found that parents don't actually want longer school days, 
but they do want schools to better prepare their children for the real world, and that includes the world of work. And yet the boss of John Lewis says they're finding many of the young folk applying for jobs cannot do basic maths. The numbers leaving primary school barely literate are frightening. Now, when Sir Coffin, Kevin Collins, a universally admired educationalist, was asked by the Prime Minister to come up with a post-Covid catch-up plan, he did. He wanted better teacher training, he wanted intense catch-up tutoring for children, and he even considered a longer school day. Now, Sir Kevin said it would cost around £12 billion. The Prime Minister said, very helpful, offered him a tenth of that, and said government would think about the rest of it in the autumn. Sir Kevin resigned, so the jury is still out on what must be done. But Robert Halfen told me earlier in this programme that the Prime Minister has to get a grip on this, or a golden opportunity is being missed. Many of the children are out because there's nothing for them to do at the moment. Well, my patience is out. I went to boarding school because my father, who was in the Royal Air Force, was moving every three years, and he didn't want my schooling or my brothers disrupted. He scrimped and saved to pay those fees. No fat cat, my dad, working class son of a sergeant in the Highland Light Infantry. But it mattered to him more than anything. My own children went to all sorts of schools, some private and very swish, and some state, but very good. Some went on to university, one went to a sixth form college, and one went to a state secondary, and then he went on to do an apprenticeship, exactly what I was talking to Robert Halfen about earlier on. At its best, education in this country and in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales is brilliant. I know, my daughter's a head teacher and we talk a great deal about it. But when it's spluttering like a car running out of petrol, it's a disaster. Education is about life. It's about learning. It's about passion. And it's about respect. It is also, as John Lewis reminded us quite sharply, it's about jobs. So, it needs sorting. That's that lot off my chest. Tell me I'm wrong. Or tell me what your experiences were, and are right now, and what you think needs doing. And if you think it's hunky-dory, I'd be delighted to hear that as well. Uh, we'll be talking about our big education story throughout the programme. Uh, you heard what I think just there, and then at two o'clock, I want to hear what you think. So, one reminder again, email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk, or get in touch on Twitter, and we are also on Instagram, and we are on Facebook. Um, can I turn back to you, Neil, on education? Because one thing I left out of that um, is that my very first school was Madras College in St Andrews, okay. which David Steele, uh, a man I'm very fond of uh, and have known for many, many years, also went to, because Dad was at RF Lucas, mm. just up the coast. Uh, you're passionate about Scotland and about Britain. Mm. And one of the standout features of Scotland has always been that it's boasted, often with great cause, that it's got a better education system than England. Not so now. N not anymore, no. Um, even while I was still at, at school, uh, you know, I went to a state, state primary, a, a state secondary, um, and even then, in the, in the 80s, I suppose, 70s and 80s, you could brag about a Scottish education. It was, it was, it was a tradition of bragging, and, and we carried it on. Uh, but, but more recently, in the last decade or so, um, it has fallen away. Mm. And we know that Scotland's schools are no longer in the league tables of schools across Europe because it's too embarrassing now to see how far we have fallen from what was once, you know, the premiership, if you like. You know, we're, we're now down in the, you know, the, the, the forgotten parts of the league. Do the SNP offer any explanation for that? Because it's, I, I know you well enough to know what your views are on the politics of Scotland and you discuss it quite openly uh, with folk. Um, but we like to be balanced here on this station as well. Do the SNP have an explanation? Uh, not that I'm aware of. The, 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 uh, the, the call always was from, from uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon that it would be education, education, and judge me on my record on education. And if that's to be the case, then her record is disastrous because, you know, education has... has uh, the, the standards have fallen like a piano out of a window. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with monkeying around with, you know, the old idea about if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But there was the curriculum for excellence and, and, and it's been played around with 
education, a primary, a, a, a secondary, has been, a, has been played around with to the detriment of staff and to the detriment, most importantly, of pupils. I'm not a, an educationalist. I'm not an expert on that. I, I don't know the detail of, of, of what has gone wrong. I simply witness it really as a, sure. as a parent. And yeah. you know, we had a lovely primary school in, in, in Stirling that my kids went to. You know, lovely atmosphere, lovely teachers doing their best, but mm. they were hobbled by by the, by what was being done to the curriculum, uh, and it, it is difficult. You know, I, I would have to say I, I still think my my kids are now at secondary school, a state school in in Stirling, and again, it, it's a it's a lovely school. Mm. So within, despite the 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 things that are being done by by uh, experts and by the government in whatever way, teachers are still good. Yeah. I, b I believe that absolutely. My yeah. my daughter is 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 taking up a place at Edinburgh University this year, or she will. She had great teachers. Mr. McAdam was our languages teacher. Mr. Crosby, the English teacher. You know, I know their names, and they were they were what you'd want for your children from a teacher. They inspired, and they brought out education yeah. at Duco to lead out. They did that. You know, they brought out from within my daughter what was there which are our talents as it turns out with, sure. with English with languages and so I, I on the one hand I know that there are problems because yeah. I read the same newspapers and see the same reports as everyone else but I know that where you need it the, the teachers are still good and, mm. and the profession is still attracting the right people with the right heart mm. and all they need is, is in some respects to be set free to yeah. do what they can do. Another thing, you saying how well you know the, the, the teachers who, who are looking after your, your children at the moment. Um, the other thing a good school and a good education system needs is active parents. Folks who do go to PTA meetings, who do keep in touch, who do read grades, do have conversations. Whether it's Scotland, England, Wales or Northern Ireland, there are some parents who drop them off because they've got other things to do. We have a responsibility too. We, we absolutely do. We were both, my wife much more so than, than I was, but we were both uh, involved in the, in the primary school. Yeah. You know, we, we turned out for, you know, events and we, you know, and we, we attended parents' nights and all the rest of it. And we felt very close to the school all the time that our, our children were going through it. And, you know, absolutely, it's, it's, I, I'm interested, mm. but by inclination, I'm interested in what's happening at the secondary school. And from yeah. time to time, I've gone in and you know done the odd talk about whatever you know, projects I've been involved with outside, and I've taken some of that into schools when I've been asked sure. to do so. Uh, and I'm I'm curious about. We're, I think it's simply important that uh, that you don't, as you say, just uh, drop your absolutely to school and, yeah. then, and, 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 and to be fair for some folks that's of necessary course, but, but we have possibly. to do two jobs to try and keep the household going of course talking of remembering teachers who or what turned you on to archaeology which which is what most people will know you about uh, before uh, before coming on and becoming one of our great mem uh, family members here but do you remember now who which teacher it was or was it something inside you that said i want to know about rocks and coastlines and the rest of it well, I think I think I'd, I had some natural inclinations to be interested in history, uh, and history along with English. Th those were always my oh, history favorite. before archaeology. Y well, yes, but the school I went to, there was no uh, mention of archaeology. Yeah. Uh, it was history. It was if you were interested in the past, it was history. Yeah. I know some schools had had archaeology as a, as a subject in the curriculum, but not mine. And it was my history teacher uh, was Mr. Waddle. Uh, who, who was, but looking back, he must have been such a young man, really. I suppose he was probably just in his late 20s, maybe, if that. Mm. And for whatever reason, I thought, and the rest of us in that class, we thought he was great. He was just one of these, he was just one of these teachers that seemed to fizz with enthusiasm. And he, he transmitted in word and deed and gesture that history mattered. Yeah. And I already thought that, I think, in a latent way. Yeah. He brought it out and confirmed my suspicion that history... I wonder, is there something magical about history teachers that because they deal in, in, in facts in the past that they also teach you how to remember their names? Because I'm a little older than you, but I still remember R.J. R.G. Edwards, Robin Edwards, who was my history teacher, who used to roar into the classroom and would draw the British Isles in three and a half seconds. I mean, the lines were not perfect, but and then whether he was talking about Northumbria and Wessex or uh, Danegeld or, or whatever it might be, or the Reformation of the English Church, the map was there. I remember him and owe him much as if it were yesterday. Yes. I, I completely, I, 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 I often talk about Mr. Waddle, yeah. and when my kids talk to us about our school days, his is the name that bubbles up to the surface yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. 
he just, Do you remember the baddies as well? I remember one or two of them. <laughs> yeah, we, we Maybe had, we shouldn't go there. Yeah, we, we, had, we had a terrifying character that walked the halls with a toz, which was the belt in Scotland, oh, yeah. which was a piece of leather that was so stiff he could walk about with it and it stayed upright on his hand. You know, it, it, um, And he wandered the halls belting at random people who'd been put out of the class by the yeah. teacher because they knew that... that Sandy T was his yeah. name, Mr. Yeah. Thompson. Nowadays we know what they were really about and we didn't know then. Uh, the other thing we discovered when, because when, we'd not met before, we've known, no. known each other for uh, about a week, That's right. uh, and I like to think that in many respects, apart from education, that we're soul brothers, because we both have a passion for dogs. Well, animals generally, but dogs specifically. Yes, yes. yeah, oh, and I can't help but mention that you, you, I know that you're connected to the world of, of horses and, and mm. things equestrian. I, I have I have ridden a bit. I can stay on a horse. I can manage a rising trot. I can make a horse stop and start. That's the limit of it. But I love those animals. Yeah. And there, there is something to be had simply from being in the presence of horses. There's a magic. Yeah. But yes, I think we both we do absolutely both share a love of of uh, of, of dogs yeah. without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. I've got two in my in my world at home, yeah. uh, and the, the they're huge. They're Irish wolfhounds. Yes, they're very tall. I'm envious. I've, I've, I've got a bit of wolfhound envy there because, we, as I was saying earlier on, to the dog trainer, we've got a lovely Saluki lurcher and, and, oh. and we've got a... Well, a, that's a, a there's a hound. Oh, there. Hounds are all... They've yeah. got so much in common, all yeah. the hounds. So, so yes. Uh, tell me a little bit more about, about family life. Uh, not in the sense, I mean, I know you're happily married and you've got the kids and what have you, but you're very sterling and you're very Scotland, yes. and we're asking you to be down here in London, uh, and, and I've got a lot of great friends in Scottish journalism who think crossing the border is almost sinful. <laughs> They'll write about the rest of the United Kingdom, but once they're God's own country, they cling to it. How do you finesse that? I've never really... If certain other... If political events hadn't gone the way they had, I would never really have thought much about the fact that I just feel, always have felt, an inhabitant of the whole place. Mm. When I was a, when I was sorry, a, by that you mean Britain, Great Britain. You know, when I was, as a teenager on on holiday with 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 my girlfriend, now my wife, uh, you know, when asked where I was from, my instinctive answer was was I was British and from Britain, and I didn't mean anything. It, it wasn't. It was just a. It was just a geographical fact. And, uh, but, but where were you born? And then I would say Scotland. And then there was always that, in there was often a great interest ab abroad, you know, if you mm. go Scotland and people wanted to talk about Scotland and you, you know, you could feel your chest puffing up with pride and people yes. liked the accent and they liked, you know, the, the history of Scotland mm. as they understood it. Yes. And great, you know, I think it's, a, it's something I never completely understood the psychology of, but as I said earlier on when I was banging on about education, uh, dad, and I've told you this, was a sergeant. Uh, his father was a sergeant of the HLI yeah. and then he joined the Air Force and, and he came south. But I swear uh, on the blessed book or any other holy scripture that when I go to Scotland whether I land in Aberdeen to go fishing or whatever it might be I know I'm there I know I'm there it's yes it's 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 runs through the marrow of my bones I am of course I'm Scottish uh, I've, I've had you know over the years with television projects you know I've had things done like my DNA tested you know that became quite fashionable for a while and I know that my my uh, my uh, the, the DNA that I've inherited from my mother's side uh, when when tested, it's it's part of the it's in with the bricks, as they say. You know, my my mother's DNA has has been in Scotland from the beginning. You know, going back into you know beyond the reach of memory. Yeah, but thousands, tens of thousands of years, that DNA has been there, and and I think that manifests itself in me. And and my dad was so magnetically pulled to the Highlands. We have no well. My mum's family is connected to the Highlands, but he his family not. He's a Lowland Scot. Mm. And the, the, his pull to the Highlands was, was, a, was a sight to behold. Any chance he got, he wanted to be up there. And, and I, I absorbed a lot of his love of, of landscape from, from yeah. those trips that I made with him. But I've never seen any, uh, any contradiction. I've never seen any problem in feeling that I am, uh, that I am a, a son of Scotland, but I am also a, a son of the great British archipelago. That's, that's, how, that's how I understand myself. And the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom of Great Britain, of course, yeah. Because we can have punch-ups about that with the good people who are kind enough to join us. I'm happy to but debate GB it. News is England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Here's the thing, Alistair. I don't really feel the need to tell anybody else what their identity is or to, or to persuade them to think of themselves differently. I just say, if you ask me what my identity is, I will tell you. If you have a different identity, I'm, I'm happy for you and we can chat about that until the cows come home.
good to talk to you. Uh, the cows are still out there. When they do come home, uh, enough is enough. But for now, brilliant. Really good. Uh, and awesome. thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, we will hear more from him and indeed other members of the family as the programmes progress these weekends. I'm on Saturday and I'm on Sunday between 12 and 3. Good of you to be with us and I hope very much indeed that you will stay with us and listen and watch him when he's on as well. We've got lots more coming up on today's show, uh, including more from Neil. But first, time for the weather.